I'm going to start off by saying we are really glad to be at Rose, uh, Roseburg and uh, talking to you guys at this workshop. So um, I'm uh, going to be talking about the overall design process of our robot, uh, which is called the Wolverine, as well as specific mechanical components of the Wolverine. Uh, so first of all, can I see a show of hands to see um, who participated in Rescue last year? All right, so uh, quite a few amount of people. So. I'll go through this really quickly, but in essence, rescue is an FTC challenge. Uh, and last year, what, we, uh, what the robots had to do is pick up balls and blocks, uh, which is debris, and climb up various degrees of incline and put this uh, debris into our team assigned baskets on the mountain. And some of the game challenges that we noticed were that uh, it was kind of hard to climb up these steep inclines, and we wanted to avoid tipping over while getting these tasks done very efficiently. So after we watched the kickoff video, the first thing we did was watch the video a bunch more times. So uh, as the first meeting of the build season, we just got together as a team, and we just replayed the video over and over again until we got a very firm grasp of what was going on this season. We noticed, we noticed potentially challenging tasks, and we noticed potentially high scoring tasks that we can, um, that we can at attack, sure. And the se second thing that we did was we evaluated priorities. So in this period of about two weeks, we got together as a team again, and we used, it, we used a uh, pretty handy tool called the whiteboard. And yeah, this whiteboard that we always use is pretty handy because uh, we could uh, transfer our mental ideas into visual designs so that every single member on the team can uh, see what, uh, what we were thinking. And uh, we also, so we also use a whiteboard to, uh, you can't really see, you can't see really well, but we use it to prioritize which tasks that we wanted to face. And we all, um, if we had a disagreement in a design, then we would evaluate the pros and cons of each design and we would have a discussion as a team. And uh, later we uh, finalized the uh, prototype of the, uh, the overall design of our robot. We talked about what the drive base should be, we talked about how we should collect the debris, and we talked about um, how our robots would extend, and et cetera. All right. And before I get into the specific mechanical uh, components of the robot, I just want to stress our prototyping process. So uh, we didn't, uh, as for every single FTC team, we didn't know the ideas immediately. We had to go through a um, evolution of uh, prototypes. In each of these evolutions, use a different kind of material. We started off with paper, then we uh, evolved into cardboard, then polycarbonate, then a thin, thin aluminum, and then a final, finally a competition grade aluminum. And the reason why we wanted to make such, uh, we wanted to use such rudimentary materials is that we wanted to be able to mold, we wanted to be able to bend uh, these prototypes to fit well with, uh, um, with each design. And we found that uh, we had, a, so each component had around 10 iterations of these prototypes before we could finally, we could uh, have a final product. And this is just something we noticed uh, that happened throughout the build season. All right, so uh, as I said before, our robot's name was the Wolverine. It's called, it's called the Wolverine uh, for a reason that I will mention later, but uh, it uses uh, seven DC motors, nine server motors, and uh, weighs approximately uh, 40 pounds. And because this year was the start of the new uh, control system, uh, we experimented with the number of motors that we could use, and we found that it, it was capable of uh, handling this many amount, this big amount of motors. Uh, so the three specific uh, components of a robot I will talk about is the our four-wheel drive or our drivetrain, our multi-stage linear slide system, as well as our uh, sweeper system. All right, so let me start off with the drivetrain. So you may notice that this does not, uh, so these wheels do not look anything like uh, the four wheels that we use here. Well, this is because this is our initial design that we used uh, before state. Uh, so when we designed this wheel, this drivetrain, 
we initially uh, came together as a team and we wanted to uh, actually climb across the mountain. Later we would realize that this was inefficient, but this was the prevalent idea in the beginning. So how we designed these wheels is that we thought that we saw the churros as the pins on a, a chain. And we, we saw that our uh, wheels could be uh, like the sprockets. So we designed our wheels off of the design of sprockets. Uh, you guys know the sprockets on a chain, right? Yeah, okay. So these we called sprocket-based design, sprocket -based wheels or sprocket wheels. And you can see here we evolved from these spikes to grooves and finally to hard metal and rubber. And this is, uh, so we had mo over, we had tens of iterations of these that we either 3D printed or, and then we, uh, we carved into uh, rubber and metal that we use for competition. Uh, unfortunately, we realized that this was sort of inefficient because it had a really tough time to actually latch on to the first churro, and it was really hard for the builders to calibrate the specific positioning of the sprocket wheels. So that's when we transitioned to a hybrid of a sprocket wheel and a four-wheel uh, drivetrain. So uh, we noticed, we realized that not all s of the wheels had to have sprockets or grooves in it. Only the first set, the front set, that actually latched onto the churros first. So what we did was we used a four-wheel design, uh, but in the front of the robot, we had an elevated set of two wheels with grooves. In this case, uh, we put zip ties because uh, uh, it was against the rules to, uh, something about like it was carving into the mat, so we had to use zip ties as our grooves. And uh, unfortunately, this was also pretty inefficient because when the uh, front set of wheels tried to climb up the mountain, it would end up just pushing the robot backwards and we would essentially just fall over and couldn't do anything for the rest of the match. To solve this, we actually went to the final design, which is just um, a four-wheel uh, drivetrain uh, with stealth wheels. And this, around this time, we realized that we didn't even need to climb up the mountain in the first place. All we need to do was uh, go to the lift cl uh, low cliff zone and use the um, extent of our uh, uh, linear slide system, which I'll talk about later, in order to score the, um, the debris into the bu uh, back bu buckets. So I think Justin here is going to demonstrate the, uh, our drivetrain. Yeah. OK. <laughs> All right, now on to the, our sweeper and debris storing system. So uh, by state, we realized that there was a really prevalent, uh, prevalent design of collection systems. It was basically a, a wheel, like a, not a wheel, a wall of sweepers that could just uh, randomly collect any type of debris and just like shoot them into the robot. Well, we didn't want this kind of random collection. We wanted precise collection. So what we did was we used a set of latex tubes with rubber for traction. And uh, in order to optimize the sweeping range and the pushing power, we rotated the um, latex tubes to a 45 degree angle using one set of bevel gears and one motor. And this, uh, if Justin could, uh, yeah. So this kind of sweeping uh, allowed very precise collection so our drivers would know, uh, so would, can choose whichever uh, debris to, um, to collect. See, if they only wanted to, uh, blocks for stacking, then they would uh, only collect blocks. If they wanted balls for uh, rolling, I guess, then they would they'd collect balls. All right, so our bucket, uh, initially, uh, we had a dilemma. So we had this sweeper system that could cl uh, basically collect a line of debris, but we didn't know how to store this. We didn't know what shape, we didn't know what length our debris storing system would be, and we didn't know if we should filter balls, filter blocks, or accept all of them. And that's when we had a game-changing discovery. We realized that f uh, the amount of five blocks, so the, uh, the uh, length of five blocks equals four balls, equals uh, different various combinations of balls and blocks, and this discovery that we uh, experienced uh, led us to uh, our initial design of a, just a straight bucket. And I bring up the, uh, the, uh, the combinations of balls and blocks and their lengths because I just wanted to emphasize how uh, that uh, teams getting into FTC can play around with the uh, debris elements and they can really uh, find clever ways to get uh, to bypass these challenges. So our initial bucket, as you see here, is just a, a straight bucket. It was uh, 
connected to a linkage, which was connected to our linear slide system. And it would extend when the linear slides extend and retract when the linear slides would, would retract. And to dump the debris, it would tilt, and then a door would open, um, which would let out all the debris. Uh, so uh, we realized that this design was actually pretty slow, and it missed a lot of balls and blocks when dropping debris. So that's when we, uh, by the later competitions, we made a sort of two two uh, two function or dual function dumping system. The first type of dumping that we had was like a fast dumping mode, which uh, was the original uh, dumping that we had before. The bucket here would tilt, and then it, uh, the door would open, which will let all the debris out pretty fast. But then we also had another sort of uh, dumping mechanism, and basically this mechanism allowed the um, the bucket to open up from the inside uh, from the middle. And it would, basically, it would basically just separate the uh, buckets, and this would allow all the debris to um, to like drop out uh, drop out at once in a very precise manner. Yeah. Okay. And uh, another reason why we had this uh, precise dumping mode was because uh, we all uh, some something that we realized was we needed to have a stacking strategy. By stacking strategy, I mean um, it was kind of. It was actually very inaccurate. Just it was very uh, inefficient to drop the debris randomly into the buckets. We wanted to stack the blocks so it would maximize the amount of blocks per bucket. And this just shows our two modes of dumping. For the fast dumping, it would just let all the blocks out um, in a straight manner, and for pre uh, precise dumping, it would drop all the debris into one uh, th through one hole. All right, so uh, for our slide system, I always mention this linear slide system. Well, our linear slide system was a three-stage linear slide system that could um, reach all the way up to the low cliff bar. And something unique about our linear slide system was that we specifically designed uh, the, change, the chains, uh, and using this chain system, all three, uh, linear all, all three stages could lift up at the same time. If you guys could retract and extend the slides. You can see how all um, three stages of linear slide move at the same time. And uh, at the end of this presentation, you guys can co come close to it and see how we designed it. But yeah, that's just the essence of it. Another thing about the linear slide system was that we designed our robot, oh, our linear slide system, to hold both our uh, bucket and our hanging hook system. And I'll talk about that actually right now. Our hook system consisted of three uh, rubber band uh, spring-powered hooks. If you, yeah. All right, and these hooks, um, these hooks pop out when a, a sort of secret, uh, a secret stage uh, is released through rubber bands and a, like a servo. And after this is released, uh, three hooks pop out. The first set of hooks that pop out uh, actually bring us from the low cliff bar to the, uh, I think it's the median cliff bar. And the other, uh, other two hooks actually allow the robot to engage. Hmm? Oh. So the other hooks allow the robots to engage onto the uh, cliff pull-up bar. And this hook allows the robot to uh, deactivate the all-clear signal. And uh, I just wanted to point out one thing. Uh, how, so we designed this sort of uh, release mechanism through a servo that, uh, through a mechanism that we modeled off of a hotel door. It's like a deadlock. And uh, if you guys can track the servo. So, so in one, when the servo turns, this would be able to just lock in like that. And during competitions, we realized that we only needed to pop this out one time. And we used an elastic uh, energy sort of system just to, to have uh, just have a one time uh, pop out. So actually, let's see. So originally the <laughs> sorry. So originally the hooks would be stored like this, and when the and when the drivers wanted to whatever. So when the drivers wanted to pop it out during end game, they would just release release one servo, and this passive system uh, relieved the use of any electronics, and it was very, very, effi very efficient. Yeah. All right. 
And also, one thing I wanted to point out is we actually timed these hooks. So as you may notice, this one pops out almost 270 degrees. And this one, these pop out maybe about 45 degrees or 90 degrees. We designed it like this because we wanted this hook to actually go behind the, lift, uh, uh, the low cliff pull-up bar, the cliff pull-up bar. And because it takes more time to swing 270 degrees than 45 degrees, even though this is released first, it could uh, allow the robot, it, it could allow the uh, hook system to actually go behind the cliff pull-up bar. All right, so uh, before I finish, I just wanted to um, talk about some of our uh, repair and wire management, uh, I guess, protocols. So our robot structure was designed so that uh, builders could very easily replace motors and faulty wires in the time of a competition. Uh, just by, I guess, uh, just by the builders um, or the yeah the builders extending the linear slide, it could, uh, we could access all the electronics in the interior of the robots. Uh, in addition, we have all the wires running down a, a chain link system to make sure no wires fray, and we made sure that every single wire that we had on the robot was zip tied onto uh, a metal channel in order to reduce fraying as well. In addition, we uh, this one will, uh, this I won't really talk about because um, some of my fellow team members will talk about. But we have a USB relief system that ensures a reliable connection with the electronics. To make our robot very uh, mechanically reliable, we assigned an inspection crew that consisted of a few a few of our team members. Every time we made a robot uh, mechanical component, this inspection crew would make sure that uh, every single every single um, component was working fine and it fit in with the robot. We also had a, like a test program that um, our programmer made that we ran before every single match to make sure every single component is working fine, like the servos and the motors. We also had a checklist um, that the builders used to check if the robot was functioning. And some other clever tricks we did was we used a drilling machine and just basically drilled as many holes as we could with the robots. And this is just to reduce the amount of weight. Uh, we also used many polycarbonate shields you may see here, and we used a lot of plows um, to just push the debris out of the way. And uh, at the later stages, we noticed that we faced some electrical discharge issues, so what we did was we actually, uh, yeah, at Worlds, we just covered the entire front robot with duct tape, and even though it didn't look really well, it, it served its purpose. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and in addition, we used anti-static polycarbonate sheets uh, that, surrounded the the sound that surrounded the electronics to reduce the static buildup. And for our motors, uh, every single mo motor and uh, wheel axle that we used, we made sure that we locked tight. Uh, we locked tight the, the shaft collars as well as these screws. Uh, we locked locked tight the screws, and we made sure we had shaft collars. Whoops. And this is just to make sure the axles don't fall out. I noticed that many teams had their axles fall out during competitions. Uh, something really useful to use is Loctite. And this Loctite is basically like metal glue. You just put it in there. And after a few days, it really sticks to the metal. And it, it, it makes sure uh, the screws don't pop out. Uh, in addition, all around the robot, we had passive systems. For instance, we had a elastic energy rubber band passive system here. We had a passive system to actually hook onto the low clip bar. Uh, sorry, the low cliff zone. Uh, just by driving into the uh, low, the first churro, the robot would just l would latch on. And the reason we use passive systems is to reduce the risk of electronic failure. And finally, we had a lot of our stress tests calculated through uh, BTC MathCAD. Uh, so thank you for listening. If you want more information, check out our her website, our Facebook, or our Twitter, and we will be posting a lot there. Thank you. Her question was, did we watch uh, YouTube videos of other robots in the beginning of the season, I guess, to get inspiration? Uh, well, uh, yeah, that is so something really handy I forgot to point out. To get uh, motivation, or not motivation, inspiration to design some of these, we uh, looked at other YouTube videos and saw their pros and cons and designed some of our robot components using them. Her question was, uh, how, do we fit, how do we design the robot so it all fits together? And uh, this one thing, that is one thing the, that we had to design a lot in the beginning of the year. We had to make sure that these components fit together. So this central, for instance, the central linear slide system, we made sure that it, it, um, 
it smoothly went into the robot, and we actually had a pretty tough time because it kept on colliding in with the electronics. So uh, what we did was we we, uh, we installed like polycarbonate shields to protect the electronics from the bucket, for instance. And that's something that um, if there was any uh, collision between the uh, mechanical components, we just had to, to mold each component so it would fit into the robot. It's not something simultaneous that we did. His question was, uh, do we continuously build or do we have sessions where we, where we pause and do other stuff? Uh, so we uh, basically continue, uh, continuously build throughout the build season. After, uh, so the, the, our, we have an initial design by the time we get to the first competition, but after every single competition, there's something that we learned during the matches, and we just get together as a team and we discuss what we can improve on the robot, and we spend the time between each uh, competition making these changes and making our robot uh, better inch by inch. So we participated in a league system, and each league system, uh, there was a league ma league competition every few weeks, and uh, through the league system, we learned a lot about the, our cap the capabilities of our drivetrain. For instance, we still had the sprocket wheels during the league system. We couldn't even uh, we couldn't even do anything. We we scored literally zero points at the league system because we couldn't we couldn't really do anything. We had static problems, and through the league system, we tried to fix our bucket, our drivetrain after each competition. We had a lot of static discharge problems, uh, especially at super regionals. We uh, discharged we, uh, static problems. Let me just uh, explain. So when the robot, uh, our robot has rubber wheels, and when they rub on on the rubber mats or the foam mats, it generates a static buildup. And when this, when part of the robot touches something conductive, uh, like a uh, metal part of the field, the static discharges and it kind of breaks all of our electronics. And we had we faced a lot of these issues and that's something we had to deal with throughout the competition. Uh, something that, some things that we did was we installed anti-static polycarbonate sheets uh, between our electronics to reduce the amount of static discharge and we also uh, crudely put tape in order to block out anything conductive on a robot. Initially, we designed the robot to get as many uh, game tasks as possible, but we, f we started focus uh, in the beginning, we focused on stuff that we could handle at first. Like, we couldn't handle scoring at first, so we just focused on our drivetrain so our robot could actually move. Well, originally, we actually uh, wanted to have like a six-wheel drive system where the front, the front and back two wheels uh, could actually, would, would actually be used uh, on the field, but to get up the bar, to get up the churros, we had like an elevated middle set that could uh, also drive through, um, uh, drive over the churros, and that was the prototype for our sprocket wheels, actually.